Welcome to the Business Life of Husband and Wife podcast. A show based on real experiences in business and life. Hey guys, welcome back. We Episode 85, 85 today. today. So as you guys know that have listened to the show, we got four formats to our show. We have our couples episodes. So in that we interview couples, we get the ins and outs and all the bouts, find out what they do differently, what they do the same. And we try to learn from one another. Absolutely. And in the second format of the show, and that's actually what we're doing today is we have expert episodes. So what you guys heard in season one was all the one oh ones of these different topics. So this is anywhere from accounting, marketing, uh, HR specialists. Um, and then this year, what we're doing is we're doing a little bit more niche topic specific, which is what we're diving into today. And then our third format of the show is our Q and a episode. So that is, you guys can submit questions on the top right hand corner of our website, which is business life of husband and wife.ca, or you guys can shoot us a DM on Instagram and Facebook as well. Yeah. And lastly, as you guys know, we do a foundation hour episodes. Those are the 10 chapters of our book that we're working on. So in time stacking, trying to be more efficient and learn, it's better to vocalize what you're reading and learning and trying to produce on paper. So we've done nine episodes now. You got one more Just about before we finalize, start two. Finally, yeah, start finalizing book number two. Yeah. So, okay. Without awesome. further ado, though. Expert episode. Expert episode. Uh, we got an awesome guest today for you guys. Somebody that uh, was one of our mentors and leaders at the, the Evolve, Evolve event that we, I think we, what episode did we talk about that on? I'll have to, I'm going to have to look that up for you yeah. guys and I'll, <laughs> I'll post it on our social media, what episode that was. But uh, so we got Josh Kosnick with us today. He was one of the leadership coaches at the Evolve event. And I'm going to let him introduce himself because he's got pretty thorough yes, background yeah, on extensive. finance <laughs> and leadership. So we'll let, kind of let you introduce yourself. But welcome, uh, Josh. Thanks for having me, guys. It's been, it's been good catching up with you already a bit this morning. And uh, can't wait to get into some fun topics with you all. But uh, as mentioned, leadership coach. So I was a leadership moderator in the sessions for you guys, but that's what I do for a living. So uh, I had a long background in entrepreneurship with uh, financial advisory, built up a personal practice to over 100 million in AUM. And by age 35, sold that as I was asked to take over a large firm. And we had over 100 advisors, 250 employees, and we're doing awesome stuff in the communities and continue to help people achieve their dreams, whether it be retire early, save their kids' education, uh, all the different things that go along with that world. So it was very rewarding for me to, uh, to be in that space. And then two years ago, just without going into that long story, some stuff happened where we came to a culmination where I was bought out. And uh, in that regard, I had a crossroads. Do I stay in this industry? Do I continue to go down the path and the stuff that I've come to become an expert in and really good at and and just continue that path? And I I really sat down and had a reflection point. I did a really fancy T-chart, just drew a line down the side, uh, one side of the paper and said, on this side, what did I love about my previous role and job? And on this side, what did I really not like or hate in that regard? And I was starting to brainstorm of what if I could create a world that I just did all the stuff that I love and minimize or mitigate or eliminate all the stuff that I hated, which was HR, compliance, people issues, egos, all the different stuff that uh, drove me nuts and gave me some of this gray hair that you now see all over my face and head. But uh, In that regard, I I was able to create that and I bought uh, 80 acres and created a leadership retreat where I can have entrepreneurs and their leadership teams come out, remove themselves from the fluorescent lights and Zoom screens and come to nature and actually work on themselves to go back to their homes and businesses as better human beings. So, and a lot of times my, I am on Zoom coaching entrepreneurs all over the country and Canada as well. And I'm in the US, but Canada as well. And uh, it's been so rewarding and fun uh, to be able to help people and see them grow, not just in business, but in their personal life as well. I always tell people, if you want to bring me on as a personal coach, or whether it's a leadership coach or anything else, like I'm going to dig in on your relationships with your spouse. I'm going to dig in on your health. I'm going to dig in on your mental health. If you just want a performance coach, I know some of the best in the industry, and I will link you up with them. But I am going after the whole person and making sure that uh, you are not only wealthy and good and successful in your business, but also good in your home life with your spouse and your kids and your health and all that stuff as well. 
So I always get that out in the front and all in the open with people right away. It's like, if you don't want that, I'm not your guy. <laughs> That's very valid. A lot of people would be intimidated by that. And a lot of people like to hold that, those components of their life separate. Whereas we are very much the other, other end of that spectrum because we're all encompassing. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. As our listeners know, like, oh my God, that's a short answer for it. But that, that is a very intimidating thing it's, for people yeah. to like, when you fold, like you, all that's laid out, like the cards are here. Yeah. Right. So that's intimidating for people initially. Cause like when we first met Josh, like you come across intimidating to, to like, to visit with, right. Just that's, but that's just your approach. And a lot of people don't know how to handle that now. So how do you, I just want to touch on that. How do you navigate that when people don't know how to handle that approach of like, here's the cards, take it or leave it. Like, this is what we're doing. Yeah. Well, so I, I think I approached that in my intro, probably a little rougher than I would in an intro call. Um, <laughs> there's, like, some like <laughs> there's some dialogue that happens before that, but, uh, but I do make sure that it's out there because I want people to know this is where I stand. I don't want them to be surprised in our first meeting when I'm asking you, hey, on a one to 10 scale, where would you rate your relationship with your wife right now? But like, I don't want them to be surprised by that. I'd be like, wait, I thought we were here to talk about business. Or well, we are, but everything in your personal life does bleed into your business. You can't mm -hmm. separate the two as much as you try. So I, uh, the intimidation piece though, like I've gotten that, throughout my life and um i don't know if it's just my face clint or or what, <laughs> whatever it is maybe i have rbf um uh, i've <laughs> literally gotten that my entire career that i come across intimidating and some people and, and especially the people that really have gotten to know me uh laugh at it now and they're like he's just a big teddy bear uh but but i do i do come across intimidating or intense or whatever it may be but I also am extremely, as you guys got to witness me, very vulnerable in that. So I actually teach a lot on alpha vulnerability because I think that most males don't actually think they can coincide. And so you're either a vulnerable beta male or you're an alpha and, you know, take life by the balls. And that's not the case. Like you can actually be both. And in fact, I think it makes you more of an alpha when you can actually show your vulnerable side and let people know that, hey, I'm perfectly okay crying in front of people. I am perfectly okay in saying, okay in saying that I made a mis mistake. I, I messed up here. And this is, how I'm, this is how I'm going to fix it. Like those two things should coincide, not just hiding our mistakes, not trying to um, mask who we really are, uh, for what people, what we think people want from us. Like, so the, the alpha vulnerability, I lean into a lot with, especially men, because we've been raised, and I was raised by a man that, that you know, rub dirt on it, don't cry, you're a man, like be a man, all those cliche things. I was raised that way. And I had a great father by, by no means, but that's how he was taught. And so he passed that down. Well, I'm teaching my son differently. Which make, that I'm makes sense that. though, because we're, we both had, like, that's, that was how everybody was well raised. That's how they were. Our dads were both probably raised the same way. Like you tough it out. You don't cry. Like you don't talk about it. Yeah. You don't talk about it. Definitely just, don't talk about it. <laughs> no, you just get it done. So I kind of want to just touch and I'm kind of jumping off script a little bit. Cause that's kind of how, how that's how my brain <laughs> that's always, that's how my brain always goes. <laughs> but let's let, let's talk a little bit about how that works in a relationship. So you educating your clients and like on how to be both, you know, alpha and beta and like be vulnerable, but also like take care of business. How does that relate? Like tying that with your spouse a little bit, like you, you, you have that kind of down to like a science in your, and how you approach it. How do you approach that with, with your wife and your family? Cause like Robin and I kind of have a different way of probably doing it because I have an mm -hmm. on off switch. So I always say I have an on off switch. So when I'm at work, different, I, I approach things quite a bit differently. It's, it's more direct, more stern. And we're kind of like, we're going towards a, a goal and there's no, not as much emotion tied to those decisions as when we're, we're here, home. we're at home. Yeah. Yeah. You said one thing. I don't know that I ever take the beta role. I, I just I have a negative connotation with that word in general. Like I'm always the alpha. However, 
I will take, I will allow others to lead. I'm not too proud. And I, so I think the, the distinction is removing your ego from the situation. And I've gotten really good at that, either from being humbled over the years or just growing up and having three daughters before I had a son, whatever it is that uh, did that for me is like, I'm going to let my wife lead in a lot of situations, especially as it pertains to our daughters. Cause I, that's a foreign world to me as they're growing up. Uh, so, and in, in business as well, when you hire great leaders, you also need to let them lead. You can't be micromanaging them either. So I don't know that I ever take the beta role, but I will allow others to lead because that's how you develop leaders. And so now with my wife, uh, you specifically asked, I think there's, I think one of the things I've done well is the, so I talked about removing the ego but also when you remove the ego, you can remove, you can separate yourself from the emo emotion of things. Like you actually detach from the emotions of the moment that you're having in that instance. And so there's a lot of times where she'll get emotional because that's more of her being and how she processes, especially through frustration, where I'm utterly detached and unemotional. Whereas if I was emotional and, and attached to my, whatever was going on internally with me, it would actually cause a bigger argument than it needed to be versus me actually detaching from the emotion, detaching from the situation of like, how can I serve or how can I help in that regard? And I just, and my, my key employee, my integrator is also uh, female and it's very, very similar. Like I'm not going to, uh, like I'm gonna lead and empower. I'm not going to attach to my own emotions and ego and potentially harm the relationship. I think that's a great answer for the, yeah, that's for everybody listening. Cause that's a lot what goes on like what you said where emotions come out with frustration <laughs> that's the only time they come out is when i'm frustrated and that's do you and do you cry robin yep yeah so in the shower about, though josh I, it's more efficient <laughs> <laughs> my personality is all about efficiency so i just like get frustrated and then i cry in the shower and then it's done <laughs> <laughs> That is very efficient, Robin. I, I give you props for that. But what I would say is um, a major mistake most of us men make, and I made it early on in my marriage and life as well, is we think women cry because they're sad. And certainly that happens at times, but actually the majority of time women cry when they're frustrated. Whereas when we get frustrated, we get angry, right? It's our default emotion to get angry and yell where women is actually, they, they cry. It's just a difference in the, in the, you know, species really. Uh, and the, like that's a, that could be a generality as well, but, but there is truth to it regardless. So like someone may be sitting there with like a female being like, no, I get angry. Well, cool. But the majority of women actually get frustrated and cry. And I've experienced that with not only my wife, but also my daughters. And it's like leaning into that is like, oh, they're not sad. They're frustrated. And they're probably frustrated with me. So, okay, what do I need to do uh, to to kind of circle back and make sure that we can get back to neutral here. And so that leads back to to, to like the ego and awareness and being aware of of the situation. <clears throat> and so when you're coaching people, let's let's talk. Let's go in. Let's get back on script a little bit. I'll go into the into the coaching. So let let's talk a little bit about what you offer and um kind of what programming and what things you offer, and then we'll kind of dive back into the mm -hmm. that topic. Yeah, so I talked a little bit about the leadership retreat. That's when I get to engage with the leaders team. But I usually don't get like foreign or um, random messages about, hey, can we come out to your land? No, it's usually through relationships. And so when I'm engaging with a business owner for the first time, we're having a conversation about there's two major problems that I see businesses run into. And there's like 136 issues underneath these two major problems. But the two major ones are human development or leadership development. And then the second one being systems and processes to help the business scale, grow, to become more efficient, to have more fun in your business, all that different stuff. So on the leadership development side, I, I've been trained and developed and so passionate about that for 20 years. Like that's everything that I've done. So I'm very, very skilled on the leadership and human development side. And hopefully that's come out a little bit already today and will come out continue as the interview progresses. But the second side, the systems and processes, I wasn't as good at. I'm a, I'm a visionary, 30,000 foot uh, thinker, big ideas, love managing big relationships and uh, hate getting into the weeds and details and spreadsheets and all that bullshit. Um, so the systems and processes was not a strength of mine, 
but I kept running into my entrepreneur clients and friends that had problems with this. I'm like, I need to be able to help. So I went and got trained to be certified in EOS implementation. That comes from the book Traction by Gino Wickman, a uh, timeless read for entrepreneurs. I don't know that it would do much good for people that aren't in business, um, but fantastic book for anyone that is in business. And so I got trained on that to be able to help implement those systems for my business owner clients that need those. I had been introduced to that a number of years ago when I had the firm and had over 250 employees. I was already implementing some of that stuff. I had read the book, read Rocket Fuel, and read a couple other of the series. And I tried implementing it on my own. And when I got trained on it, um, actually, it was only earlier this year. It's taken off since then, but uh, all the time that I've spent with it. But I was like, man, I did like 20% of that right. Like, I, I messed up a lot. So that's why professional implementers exist. And they're worldwide. They're in Canada. They're in the UK. They're in Australia. They're in the US. They're, they're almost everywhere. Actually, I had another guy in my class from um, uh, Sweden. And uh, so it is an unbelievable, simple system that anyone can implement. What I would say is, yes, there are self-implementers like what I tried to do. And the only reason that I say, when people ask, like, why did you try and do it on your own? Because I'm ADD, I didn't read the epilogue in the book. In the very back of the book, it says, hey, you can hire these professional implementers to come into your business and help you implement these systems. I didn't read that part. So I didn't get that far because I would have gladly wrote that check to have someone come in and help me implement those systems. Uh, so spoken like anyhow. a true visionary. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's why I needed an integrator at that time. Be like, hey, Josh, did you see this part in the book? that said we could just bring someone in, pay him a few grand and let's go. I'm like, no, this is why I that. have Robin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's right. So anyhow, well, I, just, I messed I up a so lot. Funny. I, I, and that's why I'm so honest with it because it's real. Us visionaries, this is exactly what we go through. We're yeah. like, oh, squirrel. We got to go fix that problem. Uh, <laughs> but so that's the... That is the, the simple systems within EOS help any business owner. And I got to talk to Gino Wickman, the author and inventor of the system uh, back in February. And he says the biggest compliment that he can get is when someone tries to challenge his system and say, hey, it's, it's so simple. Like, like, I get it. I get why it works. It's just, just way too simple. Like, it can't, can't be that good. And he goes, thank you. He goes, I spent the last 25 years trying to make it as simple as possible so that every entrepreneur, every business owner can implement these timeless tools into their business to help their business get their vision on track from the ownership to the leadership all the way down to the rank and file and get everyone rowing in the same direction and towards that vision and on mission and so that they can get everything they want out of their business and have a hell of a lot of fun doing it. So thank you. <laughs> that, that's so I just downloaded Traction, like literally like uh, three days ago on Audible so that I can listen to it while I'm working. So I'm going to, I'm going to catch up on it. So a lot of the questions I'm going to ask about that kind of system from you today are like just me not knowing either. So it'll be good for everybody listening because I don't, I don't know anything about it yet. I literally just found out by researching about Josh and sorting things out and trying to get this episode put together. That, that was a, like, I didn't even know about it. Never even heard of it no. before. It was brand new to me. So that shows you where, where I'm lacking on an information because there's so much out there. It's like, where do you find and what, why is it important? And is it actually worth the time as an entrepreneur to take the time to look at it? So for me, there's like, it's like, we were talking about squirrels. Robin says I have dueling hamsters. <laughs> <laughs> So for me, it's the same thing. It's like, I don't know what one to grab. So that's why I want to kind of dive into this one because it's simple. And I always tell the guys when they're explaining things to clients or when we're writing our procedures on it for us in our back end is treat me like I'm five. You write it like you're five years old. And can you problem solve mm. it line by line as if I and read it like I just treat me like I'm a child and I don't know what I'm doing and I need a step by step guide. Because if, if, if a kid can do it, and figure it out. And they're smarter because they're, they can adapt quicker, but most people can implement those systems. I think that's why this one kind of caught my attention. I was like, I think this is why I want to talk about more of this on the episode. So just so the audience knows, the rest of this episode will be specifically for Clint, but hopefully you get something <laughs> out of it too. 
as long as both of you can stay on task. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's why I'm here. <laughs> so let, let's just touch base on there. I know there's six components. So let's just touch base on those six components and kind of just like a little synopsis on each one and what, what they're about for people who don't have a clue about the system or even just like a, a Coles notes on the, on the beginning of it. Yeah, so uh, when Clint says there's six components, there's six components that we try and get everyone's business really in touch with. And I'll just go through real briefly those six components. One is vision. And obviously most people know what vision is and having a vision. But what I find most interesting is a lot of times the entrepreneurs have the vision in their head and they haven't necessarily done a great job of explaining that vision to their, even their own leadership team, let alone the you know, rank and file person that may be uh, you know, part-time or just came onto the business three months ago or whatever it might be. The next component is people, having the right people in the right seats. If anyone's read the book, Good to Great by Jim Collins, that terminology came directly from that book. Jim Collins was a big influence on Gino Wickman. Uh, and so we utilize that. And I will tell you from personal experience, people without a great vision and without people, the rest of this is screwed. So it all starts with those two components. And what we're trying to focus on is getting in these six components as implementers, getting you to 80% strong or better. 100% is just utopia. Like that, that doesn't happen for anyone. And if it does happen, it happens on a day and then it never happens again. <laughs> so, uh, but our point is to get all of our business owners to 80% or better in any of the six components. Uh, but vision and people are the top two. And uh, without those two, the rest of it doesn't happen. But right people, right seats. I'll give you a quick aside here on the right people, right seats. Well, I told everyone at the beginning Two years ago, the financial firm was bought out for me. I had a right person, or I'm sorry, wrong person, right seat. And here, this is a very big problem. If any of you have this within your organization, this person means like, so when they're the wrong person, that means they don't fit culturally. They don't fit the core values that you've set forth. Uh, their character might be off but they're extremely talented. And so it's one of the hardest people for a business owner to terminate because they're really good at what they do. <clears throat> they just don't fit your culture. And so you, I implore you to terminate them as quickly as possible, no matter how bad it temporarily hurts because long-term they will crush your business. And that's exactly what I had going on. I wish to God, that I had read the epilogue of that book and ha hired an implementer to come into my business to sit there and tell me, Josh, you have a problem. That person over there is ruining your culture. I kept chalking his character flaws up to immaturity. I thought that I could develop his immaturity out of him. Perhaps that was ego on my side or because I've had a track record of doing that with young people, I've been able to develop their immaturity. I was just blinded that it, they were actual character flaws, not just immaturity. So that's just a quick aside. You got to have both the right people in the right seats because sometimes just, you can also go ahead, Clint. I just, I just want to touch on that, like about your, on the leadership side. Do you find that like a, we, a lot of us, like we want to help and like, especially you guys, like in the leadership roles and who, who educate on it, like you want to help everybody. And there's like that good part in you that sometimes takes over the actual logical side of like, what's going on. And that's why it's helpful to, you know, read the epilogue. Yeah. And hire someone. <laughs> well, I mean, it doesn't necessarily be an implementer. If you're not interested in EOS, have a business coach or consultant that helps you and your executive leadership team. If I had had anyone in the room, they would have saw it real quick because hindsight being 2020, like it was pretty obvious uh, that he was a cancer in the culture and it was, it was a big problem. Um, but I will say that as leaders, we tend to have bleeding hearts, meaning we think that we can help everyone. And so we see the good in everyone. And we think like, okay, well, we'll just capitalize on that and then forget the bad. But the problem is the bad may not be showing up to you, but they're decimating Robin. Like this person verbally attacked many of my female staff members. 
And by the way, because he's a narcissist, none of it was ever his fault. They were attacking him because he was black. But like, you just got to look at the evidence. It wasn't just one. It was at least five women that had stepped up and said, this person has verbally harassed me. Not sexually, but verbally berated them. To the one of them, to the point that they basically were emotionally abused. Mm -hmm. So they may be uber talented and they may be doing all the right things in front of you, but you got to also listen to your people. Mm -hmm. that, that's a big, big key in that. That's why I just want to touch on that. Cause I find like a lot of times, like, especially like even small businesses, like you, 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 you're okay with the temporary pain of having to jump back in and do the work, but you, you always want to try and fix that person. Right. Or like fix the thing that you think you can, or you're like, they'll, they'll fall into line. They'll fall into the system. And you, you, like you said, you always see the good and that. Yeah. Well, we all go through it. Mm -hmm. And it's a, even for, so for couples, like it's a tough conversation. Cause like one person sees it and the other one doesn't, it, it's, it makes things a little bit more of a pain in the ass because one person thinks they can fix it and the other person can't. So you really got to over communicate what you're seeing day to day mm -hmm. and why that needs to happen. That's what we've had to do a couple of times now. And it's not fun. No, 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 it sucks. But that's what you sign up for when you're a leader or a business owner. And that's why no one that's ever not going to be in one of those roles that are just employees, they will never know the emotional stuff that we have to go through. And by the way, I want to say this, I will never be, I will never play the victim. Um, shame on me in that instance for not sticking up for those women. Shame on me for the thing like overriding his cancer and the damage he was doing to some of my culture uh, just because he was talented or because of my ego said I could develop that out of him and that all would be forgiven. Yeah, I think some things can't be, some things can't be forgiven. No, 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 we agree with that 100%. Yeah. There's just certain things that are, there's a line. And like I said, if it doesn't hit, hit those core values or what you're trying to accomplish, there is a line and you have to be able to eat the, eat that emotionally to, to cut that tie. But I think that's a huge lesson that you just well, taught I think everybody everyone needs to go through it as well. Yeah. I, I don't think you can, I don't know. I don't think you can learn it just by listening. Like maybe you can, but I mean, it might open your guys' eyes listening right now or, or watching that like, Hey, I might have this. I should look into it. And that's, that, that's huge, huge. That would be my hope. Clint. I, Robin, you're probably right. It's, it's hard to fathom until you go through it. But Clint, my hope would be if someone's listening today and they go, Oh shit. I think I have what Josh is describing here and I better nip it in the bud before I get to the point where he got to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's awesome okay let's back uh to the components. Let, let's go back oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so back back to the components and i want to finish up that right people right seats because sometimes you may have the right person wrong seat and what that means is really that they are a great person the the complete opposite of the person i just described right they they fit your culture to a t they exhibit your core values but they don't do well in whatever seat they're doing like there's a missing piece so then you got to find them the right seat and there are circumstances where you may have that right person but you don't have a seat for them because whatever their skill set is just isn't in the cards right now for your organization and you got to make a tough decision to let them go so all right that's vision and people the third component is data and in the data component it's running your business off of actual facts figures numbers measurables instead of ego feelings and whatever foo-foo bullshit you want to say so it's literally giving you a platform to figure out what are the measurables well how i like to describe this is we create a tool uh called a, it's just a scorecard really but you have all your measurables in there and the way i describe it is let's say clinton robin you're on a deserted island it's a nice one you got a cabana boy um but you have no contact back home, no contact with your business, like whatever. It's, it's a remote island where they want you to get off your devices. You have no access. But that cabana boy can bring you a note along with your drink. And they bring you a note and it has whatever measurables on it that tell you, that give you an absolute pulse on your business. And we, we as a leadership team, so me being the outside consultant, you as the leadership team, we decide what are those measurables that you need to see on that note to know exactly what's going on in your business. 
So that's the data component is making sure we're making decisions because then we have 13 weeks based on those measurables on that scorecard and you can start to see trends. Things just pop out at you, good, bad, and different because of what you're tracking the most important things. All right. That's just basically vanity metrics. A lot of stuff you don't want to look for, right? Well, I, it could be vanity, but it could be real things like, okay, for example, just like what were sales last week and you have a benchmark of, right? Uh, I don't know if it's 100,000 in sales that you've been hitting for the last five years, you want to make sure that, that okay, last week was only 40. What the hell happened? We've been 100 to 200 for consistently for five years. What the heck happened last week? We want to make sure that doesn't become a trend. Right, so it could, it could be vanity, but a lot of times it's just like, what's the real, what's the real, real? All right, uh, quadrant or component four is issues. So we find that a lot of business owners do a great job of discussing their issues, but never really solving them. And if they solve them, it's actually a symptom, not the root cause. And then there's another portion of business owners that keep all their issues in their head and never really bring that to the leadership table to discuss. And so what we help, what we really help with and make sure that others are, are on the leadership team are doing are creating a document where all of your issues live and breathe and that you uh, are discussing them as a leadership team, that you're prioritizing which ones are the most important and you're knocking them off. Like our goal is to get the leadership team so damn good at solving issues at the root cause so that they never come up again, that, uh, you know, the business, that's where the business becomes more fun because then you're in a, what we call a level 10 meeting, which is say like a Monday meeting with your executive leadership team. And you're like, what are we going to knock out today? The, the, the visionaries issues are on there. The integrators issues are on there. Director of finance issues are on there. Everyone's issues are on there on that document. And they can just prioritize and boom, knock them off. All right, so that's the issues component. Uh, last two, process. You actually touched on this earlier, Clint. Um, making it, dumbing it down so that a five-year-old can understand it. It's not just for you, that's for everyone. We want a process uh, for like the key components of your organization. So HR and operations, tech, marketing and sales, uh, finance, Whatever those key components of your organization is, those key roles, we want standard operating procedures for all of those. But what we don't want it is a, is a 700 page SOP manual that no one ever will read. You want that dumbed down to five year old level. And meaning if you lose a key salesperson, the next salesperson that comes in, here's your SOP, boom, ready to go. A little bit of training, ready to go. Ops person, tech person, whoever HR person, we have this manual down. So that they have a, a track to run on. And of course, there's going to be training, but it reduces the training. It reduces the frustration. It reduces the manpower by having these key components and processes really figured out ahead of time. And that, that saves a ton of money too. Yeah. In the training. Side. Oh, a ton, a ton. And what you all, the other thing, part, key part of that is make sure that it's followed by everyone, not just a few people. So that, that is a key component. And that go, does that go that goes back up to like to the people in the seats, right? Making sure that there's like accountability all the way down through. Like yeah. that goes back to two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So even though you didn't hear me talk about EOS directly in that leadership session, you saw me draw out an accountability chart. And an accountability chart is very different than an organizational chart. An org chart typically just say, here's CEO, you know, here's everyone underneath the CEO, and blah blah blah. An accountability chart is here's the visionary, here's the integrator. And then everyone is accountable to the integrator. But the integrator, so really what's the, what I'm saying by that is the key leaders are accountable to the integrator. And then everyone else is underneath those key leaders. But the integrator is the glue to the organization. So I, I don't disagree. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They don't, they don't mind confrontation. They like getting into the weeds. They want to make sure. And the classic for everyone listening, the classic, uh, example that I like to share with everyone is Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak at Apple. When Steve Jobs was alive, he was very clearly the visionary and he was great at painting the vision for all of us. 
not just his staff, like every time he spoke, we got exactly where Apple was going. Uh, and Waz was the guy that took all Steve's crazy ideas and made sure they came to fruition. And no one really knew who Waz was until Jobs died. Very true. Mm -hmm. And so that, and that oftentimes is the mark of a great integrator is no one really knows who they are, but they make sure everything gets done on the backside. So the last uh, component is traction. It's my favorite one. It's bringing all the visionary stuff down to the ground level. And the way we do that is create a 90 day world uh, that we utilize rocks. Uh, if anyone's seen this video, it's a famous YouTube video and it really came from Steve, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People where he talked about rocks as being your big, hairy, audacious things. And there's a video out there where it depicts this professor in the front of a classroom and he's like, okay, if I put in sand and gravel first and then try and put the big rocks in it doesn't fit in the jar versus if you put the big rocks in first then the gravel then the sand everything fits within that jar and it's just depicting making sure that your priorities are done first and then all the little stuff gets done after that and it's making sure that the company and the individuals within that company are always focused on the big rocks not the little pebbles so if anyone hasn't seen that video, I can't remember what it's titled, but if you search Big Rocks on uh, on YouTube, well, hopefully you get some clean video of that. <laughs> I don't know if anything else will show up, but- We'll link it in the description that. to the, yeah, the I'll, actual- I'll, I'll grab it and I'll find it and I'll put just, the actual link. <laughs> I was so thinking no about confusion. that as I said that, I was like, ah, hopefully some clean stuff comes up when you search <laughs> that. Uh, so. So anyhow, the other piece that we utilize with traction to make sure that everything is getting from the top down in the organization is called the level 10 meeting. And in that level 10 meeting, the executive leadership team is meeting for 60 to 90 minutes every single week. And the bulk of that meeting is spent IDSing, which is identify, discuss, and solve your issues. Okay. So uh, again, you go into uh, getting all the issues on a document prioritizing them and then knocking them out based on those priorities. That's the bulk of that meeting. And then, you know, what communication needs to happen down into the organization from that meeting, right? So we get to, and the reason it's called a level 10 is at the end of the meeting uh, on the executive, you go around the table, what do you rate the meeting? 10 being best meeting ever, one worst meeting ever. And what you're trying to do is get tens across the board. And the only way you do that is if you solve issues. For everyone. For everyone. Yeah. That's right. So I want to go back and since this is the Business Life of Husband Wife podcast, I want to talk about how this system relates back to like the family dynamic because there is like it, it there is a huge crossover between your life and your business. They're the same thing. Like they just all of a sudden become one when you're an entrepreneur. And, and like we all know who listen. Yeah. It's it just it's not you can't really separate the two a hundred percent. You're always going to have mm -hmm. that in the back of your mind, or it's going to be something. So how do you implement some of these things in like a family setting from like, who's the leader or how the leadership, like the, the, the parents down to the, the kids. Visionary. Yeah. Like, you know, like I kind of want to tie it in a little bit to like to couples and into to the family structure a bit. So interesting. You say that uh, in the EOS community, uh, we have a Slack channel. There's about 700 of us implementers worldwide. And uh, there is a family like level 10 meeting. Uh, and and it, it's pretty similar because each meeting starts out with good news. Each meeting starts out with uh, um, people or customer issues. And it's just five minute check in, five minute check in, check in with a you know, scorecard. The, the scorecard for a family would look very different than a business. But, um, but the, the good news and the uh, uh, people issues or customer issues, that's those are only five minutes, but they're really crucial. Like, let's say as a business owner, the business owner needs to know, hey, this employee's wife just got diagnosed with cancer or this customer's order got screwed up. Uh, what do we need to do to make sure that those, you know, we give some extra love and attention to those types of people. The owner needs to know that. Same thing for family. Hey, did you hear that uh, so-and-so's wife just got diagnosed with cancer? You know, do we want to send something to them? Do we want to cook a dinner for them? whatever, you know, something of that nature that could be part of that meeting. And then issues, right? It could be, you know, calendaring, right? 
who's taking the kids here this day um who's managing this who's managing that we got uh, got to pull double duty one kid's got dance one kid's got football right can't be in two spots at the same time all right so those are issues you can solve uh so there there is a family uh document that kind of goes along with that that could really help uh i all i think it's super powerful for husband and wife to do a vision planning retreat with each other each year especially if you're in business together uh but it's good for every family uh, if you can take time with husband and wife to like recenter, to spend some time with each other, just the two of you, you know, the, as it started before kids came into the picture and really get to uh, hone in like, hey, do we want to do any family vacations this year? Like long term, are we heading in the right direction? Are we pointing ourselves towards God? Are we pointing ourselves towards the way we want to raise our kids? Do we have them in the right schools and uh, nurturing environment that we want them to be in? Like just taking that time to ask those questions and make sure that, because I'll, you hear it all the time with um, divorcees, we just fell out of love, we or we became roommates, or we you know stopped uh, doing this, this, and that. Like, well, that's not going to happen if you're actually taking the time to do a retreat and make sure that you're pointed in the same direction. And if you're plotting together, like, okay, let's be intentional about spending time as a couple, I'm a, let's, you know, we got our uh, 15th anniversary this year. Let's go on a, just me and you little retreat vacation. Just me and you without the kids, just date each other for a few days, like the old days. And then, okay, we want to do a family one, make sure the kids are involved because we only have so many years with the kids. Like I'm conscious right now that I have six summers left with my oldest daughter and they go back to school in a week and a half. And Jenna and I are sitting there like, did our kids have a fun summer? Did we do enough with them? Like, I was like, well, they're very happy. Like, we didn't take any vacations, but like, they're at the pool a lot. They did all the activities they wanted to do, like, all the different stuff. So just checking in and making sure, but being cognizant, like, and that's if we're lucky, right? Like, if we make it, if there's no accidents that happen to us, diagnosed with cancer or dying in a car accident or whatever it may be, we get those 18 summers with our kids. So I heard this uh, really sad statistic, and my wife hates when I bring this up. Uh, but you will spend 75% of the time you will ever spend with your child from 0 to 12. And 90% by their age 18 of the time in your entire lifetime that you will ever spend with your child. Mm. That is I can see why a lot of people don't like that stat, but it's the truth. Yeah, it puts it into perspective. It is true, though. I, I guess I'm a little different, just like being from a like an agricultural background. We're still we see my parents every second day. Yeah, helping out, calving, whatever we're doing. It's a little bit different, but yeah, I can see how that is. That's the norm. That's the norm. Yeah, I'm not sure how it is in uh, Canada. I know we're quite similar countries in in a lot of ways, but in America, like a lot of kids, you know, move out. They go to college in a different city and then they, you know, they're across the country. Um, and, and so that stat could be probably even high for some families. Mm -hmm. And that's all assuming that we all get to live a healthy life, long, healthy life. Mm -hmm. That's true. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so that puts it in perspective for people. Like, are you doing what, and it goes for business and life. Are you doing enough? Cause I always say, I, I say this, Josh, all the time is you get four quarters plus overtime if you're lucky. Mm. And it's from a book I read and I, I think it's called four quarters. Actually, I have to remember if I remember correctly, but that's it. And then some old boy told it to me when it was like, I think it was his first year in business and he comes in, he's talking with me and just bullshit. And, and that's what he says. He's like, oh, I'm in my, he's like, I'm in overtime. I'm good. He's like, I, I did what I wanted to do in my other four quarters. And I was like, that is a great, yeah, you know what I mean? Perspective. Are you doing everything in each quarter to like kind of hit where you want to hit? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I think that that was a, like, that's, but that was why it's so important for people to understand. And that's why I like, could kind of, the EOS, like it ties in so well because it's, it's just people. Well, and it takes all of life's chaos and breaks it down simply so you can communicate and plan from it so easily because it gives you that structure. Yeah. One of, one of the best tools I'll tell you guys real quickly is the people analyzer that we utilize. This isn't so much family because hopefully you're raising your kids to have the values that you appreciate. 
Uh, however, in business, this is really applicable because once you have this tool, like I was actually having a conversation with my barber who his, uh, him and his wife took over for her parents. They had a, built this beautiful business uh, salon and whatnot. And, um, and they passed that on to the kids and, and they had an issue, an employee issue that he was asking me about while he was cutting my hair. I was like, that's opportune. You don't have to pay me. I'm paying you uh, to ask me questions. That's my expertise. But anyhow, <laughs> so he was having an employee issue. And I go, well, uh, what are your core values? And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, have you guys established core values and uh, hold people accountable to those? And he goes, uh, no. I said, well, that, that makes my answer a little bit more difficult uh, how, because for them, they may be thinking they're doing everything right because you haven't established what the right way of doing things are. And a lot of times you think, well, the right way of doing things is common sense, but common sense isn't always common practice. So, and everyone has different definition of what common sense is. So my point in saying all this is that when you have the people analyzer, you basically put all your employees on this side of the chart. You put your core values across the top part of the chart. And then you just give everyone a, a plus, a plus minus, or a minus. Do they exhibit the core values, right? So when using, using that chart, that should be able to help you uh, in promotion decisions, in firing decisions, in correction plan decisions. Uh, all, all decisions should be based off that people analyzer. Like, do they belong on the leadership team? And then the other part of that uh, people analyzer is the last part we call GWC. Do they get it? Do they want it? Do they have the capacity? And that should be used for hiring and promotions. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you find people in, that's a right person, wrong seat, that's where they have a capacity issue or they don't really want it. Like some people are great salespeople, but they don't want to manage people. And so you get them on the leadership team because they're a great asset to the company, great uh, salesperson. Uh, and they suck at leading people. That happens a lot for salespeople. And uh, because a lot of business owners will try and force them into that role, uh, but they just want to be a top performer and not deal with all the behind the scenes bullshit. So in that instance, they get it. And they have the capacity, but they don't want it. And I think that's where it'd be helpful for. So we're going to do a shout out for you as we kind of near the end of the episode of where they can find you. But that'd be helpful for people to understand when they need to reach out to somebody like yourself to get that other set of eyes or another coach to look and say, what are you missing? You know, are you seeing that person that they're in the wrong seat? Are you not? Like, what are you missing? Mm -hmm. So with, with your your coaching and what you're doing with your mastermind, do you want to just kind of just recap what you offer and where people can find you and all that stuff? Yeah, for sure. So all social media, I'm at Josh Kosnick and Kosnick is spelled K-O-S-N-I-C-K. So Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, all the things. And uh, in the, the Kairos Financial Mastermind, so I host a couple of different masterminds. One is for the entrepreneur or top leader in the company. We have some people in there that are great entrepreneurs. Um, and that's my basic mastermind. The one that we've came come out with recently is strictly for financial advisors, planners, wealth advisors, uh, because I had so much experience in that field and had a, a really high success. Uh, I've done everything that everyone wants to do in that world from building a large personal practice to running a large firm. Uh, I have a lot of experience and gifts to give. So I started this. And what I've also noticed with the industry is that they put up walls, uh, each company. Uh, for their advisors, because I think they're scared of getting everyone recruited away, which is fine, but they not any one company got all the best advisors, not any one company got all the best ideas. So my role, I feel like, is to break those walls down and allow for co collaboration to better serve clients. It, now, of course, you're going to get insights that are going to help you uh, alleviate some stresses, build and scale and grow faster. Great. But at the end of the day, the reason you're in financial advising or services in general is to help people. And the goal is to help people better. And so my goal is to break down the walls all these companies have created and get advisors from all different companies, all different walks of life to collaborate in one group, kind of like we do in Arte, asking questions on the, on the Facebook page and having you know five to 50 people answer based on their expertise. Mm. That's exactly what I'm trying to create 
for the financial advisors that choose to join Kairos Financial. Awesome. Amazing. That's great. I think that's important too, because like part of what you're doing too is building up people to be financially, you know, free and wealthy as well as be good people. So it ties in really well with the whole, what everybody's looking for. So guys, that's the end of the show. We, we try to keep them, you know, like I always say, try to keep them short and sweet, about 45 to 50 (laughs) minutes for your, for your commute time. And Josh is, Josh is very kind to give us an hour of his time. So we appreciate you coming on and uh, we'll uh, put all the links for all your information in the bios. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. We really appreciate it. Hey, always good to spend some time with the pigeons. (laughs) (laughs) Hey guys, as always, you can find us at businesslifeahusbandwife.ca. Thanks for listening, everybody. As always, like, share, and subscribe to help us grow the show.